All right, so let's get going through the technical difficulties. Uh, sorry you guys can't see me, uh, but I, as long as you can hear me, that's the important thing. So cardiology, what a wonderful world. Let's get going. <clears throat> Why is cardiology such an important specialty? It's such an important specialty because the number one killer worldwide for the last 50 years post-infectious diseases is uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, as we age, um, <clears throat> many of us will pass from heart attacks, strokes, vascular events. You can see on this slide that 70% uh, of deaths worldwide are accounted for by cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is a very complex disease, uh, and it all really begins with the anatomy. And I, I wanted to start because you're going to see a lot of imaging, a lot of things where you're going to need to know some basic anatomy. And the anatomy of the heart, although it's complex, is pretty simple. If you look at the uh, screen on the, uh, the, the image on the left, where you have a blue and red portions of the heart, the heart really has four chambers. It has a right atrium, it has a right ventricle, it has a left atrium, and a left ventricle. And so anytime you see the blue areas, that's where unoxygenated blood from your body is returning to the heart. So it initially returns from these two big veins, basically tubes, the inferior vena cava, which brings blood from below the heart, back to the heart, and the superior vena cava, which brings uh, blood that's above the heart to the heart. It goes to the right atrium, which then takes it into the right ventricle. The atriums are the catching chambers of the heart. The ventricles are the pumping chambers of the heart. So we have two atria and two ventricles. The right ventricle squeezes and sends the blood into the pulmonary artery, and that goes to the lungs. And the lungs' one sole function is to oxygenate blood and return it back to the heart so the heart can then pump it to the body. So you'll see that it says left atrium. Everything where that's red, that means the blood has oxygen in it. So when we actually see blood, blood that is bright red, arterial blood is bright red because it's got oxygen in it. When we take venous blood, like if you get an IV, that blood is much darker red and that's because it doesn't have oxygen in it. So the blood comes back into the left atrium. From the lungs, it comes into the left atrium. It goes into the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of your heart. And then it goes into that big red tube called the aorta. The aorta is the main vascular highway to your body. It takes oxygenated blood from the left ventricle and gives it to all of your organs. The <clears throat> image on the right-hand side basically shows you the first arteries to get the oxygenated blood are the heart's own arteries. They're coronary arteries. And these arteries are really broken up into three arteries. There's one in the front called the left anterior descending that supplies the front of the heart. And you've got one on the left, which is the uh, circumflex artery, uh, and then the right coronary artery, which obviously does the right. The right coronary artery goes to the right, but it really goes to the bottom of the heart. And if I had my arrows, you would have been able to see it a little bit better, but you can follow it down uh, where it says distal right coronary artery and it kind of goes down. That is where uh, the bottom of the heart is. So when all of you want to become cardiologists, it all begins with this. And in fact, all of medicine begins with this. It is taking a history and physical. When we go to the doctor, the doctor talks to us. They ask us, how are you feeling? What are you feeling? When did you get these symptoms? And then they examine you. They take their stethoscope and they examine you. And you'll see the two cartoons there. I like the one on the right because it's probably more uh, appropriate for this generation where <clears throat> I already diagnosed myself on the internet. I'm only here for a second opinion. I see that all the time. But the key thing here that I learned in my training is listen to the patient. The patient always tells you the diagnosis. <clears throat> Oftentimes people come in and they want this test and that test. The best test is listen to the patient. They will always tell you what the diagnosis is. Listen to them with your ears and also listen to them with your stethoscope and you will have a pretty good sense of what is exactly going on. Cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is a big, big spectrum of disease. So what are the different things that cardiologists treat? You've got hypertension, which is high blood pressure. 
coronary artery disease, narrowing of the arteries that feed the heart muscle. Remember those arteries I showed you, which were the first arteries that came off of the aorta, where you've had the uh, left anterior descending the front of the heart, the circumflex, which was on the left side of the heart, and the right uh, coronary artery. <coughs> those arteries, if they get disease, they get disease by narrowing, and we'll talk about that. Heart failure the inability of a heart muscle to pump or relax effectively. When you have a heart attack, it's because you've had coronary artery disease where you've had a blockage and the heart muscle has gotten damaged because it has not gotten enough blood to it. That portion of the heart can no longer squeeze. When it can no longer squeeze, that's what we call heart failure. Arrhythmias, arrhythmias are electrical abnormalities within the heart, abnormal heart rates, abnormal rhythms. So the heart is not only a pumping chamber, but it is an electrical organ. In order for the heart to pump, it must receive inherent innate electrical impulses that make the heart muscle function squeeze. Congenital heart disease, that's the disease that you're born with, right? You're either born with a normal heart, and sometimes people are not born with normal hearts where uh, as they were in utero, as they were being formed pre-birth, the structure of the heart became abnormal. And it used to be 30, 40 years ago, many of those children died. And now with surgery and medicines and support and some of the procedures we can do, a lot of those children live and then they live into adulthood uh, where we continue to follow them and treat them for adult congenital disease. Peripheral vascular disease. So you've got arteries everywhere. You don't just have arteries in your heart arteries, you have arteries everywhere. The aorta gives off lots and lots of different arteries. Any disease of those arteries, the aorta itself, the leg arteries, the kidney arteries, liver arteries, that's all peripheral vascular disease. So you can see there's a huge spectrum of diseases that cardiologists treat, and that's why it's such a wonderful world because you're never ever bored. The most common of all these diseases is coronary artery disease. That's what kills most people as they age. So what is coronary artery disease? You see that first circle? That's the artery in cross section, kind of cut as a hose. And you see that the white represents the blood flow. There's lots of blood flow going through that. You have a little bit of plaque between six o'clock and eight o'clock. As we progress with age, and some of our lifestyle and our risk factors, which we will review next, you get more plaque. As that plaque becomes more and more, you either block the artery significantly to the point where it gets 100% blocked, or, and this is more common, where you only have a 30 or 50% blockage in the heart artery, but it suddenly explodes, it ruptures, it becomes unstable. And <clears throat> Once it becomes unstable, you can get a blood clot that forms in the artery. The artery does not care what's blocking it, whether it's plaque that's blocking it or a fresh blood clot. That is how you get a heart attack. No blood flow goes to the heart muscle. When no blood flow goes to the heart muscle, what happens is uh, damage to the heart muscle, which is at times fatal, but at times if you treat it properly, um, you can reverse the damage or prevent the damage from happening. So how do we get coronary artery disease? This is an incredibly important public health slide for everybody listening to this. You have modifiable risk factors and you have non-modifiable risk factors. And as we learn more, we are learning that there are emerging risk factors and markers. So the modifiable, modifiable risk factors are the most important because you can do something about them. High blood pressure. As we age, our arteries get stiffer. High blood pressure is directly related to your salt intake and your aerobic exercise ability. Abnormal cholesterol levels, that's related to two things, what you eat and what your genetic predisposition to, for, to processing cholesterol is. Some people are vegetarian, some people are vegan, but they still have very high cholesterols because it's just how their livers are programmed to metabolize cholesterol. Diabetes. Diabetes, again, is multifactorial. You uh, have a genetic predisposition to getting diabetes, which means that if you were born with it in your genes, you're probably gonna get it. But the most common form of diabetes is type two diabetes, where your lifestyle, obesity, eating too many carbs, no physical activity, you will 
slip into type 2 diabetes. And it has the same cardiovascular effects as type 1 diabetes. Cigarette smoking, that is actually the most modifiable of all risk factors. That is completely willful. And the United States of America has done an amazing job with public health of decreasing cigarette smoking. If you smoke, you will get heart disease, you will get vascular disease, and you will get lung disease. And the worst lung disease of all is lung cancer. So don't smoke. Obesity and physical inactivity, obviously all of the things that I just talked about, if you're uh, obese and you are not physically active, aerobically physically active, running, swimming, biking, uh, you're gonna get diabetes, you're gonna get high blood pressure. All of that will contribute to your progression of cardiovascular disease. Then there are other non-modifiable risk factors. If you come from a family where there's a lot of heart disease, there's nothing you can do about that, right? Those are a, a genetic predisposition. Age, we all age. Male versus female gender. And I think this is important. I'm gonna take a little bit of time to talk about uh, women's heart disease, uh, just so you understand that there is a difference between uh, genders as well as with uh, different ethnicities. So this is the most complex slide you're gonna see from me. And I think it's a really important slide. See where it says at the top, increased peritoneal fat. That's a fancy way of saying that you got a gut, a beer belly. So how do you get that? Well, you get that really because of genetics and your environment. And environment is diet and lifestyle. So what does that increased peritoneal or belly fat do? Belly fat causes streaks in your liver, fatty streaks. Those fatty streaks make your body go into something called a metabolic syndrome. That means your blood pressures go higher. That means your blood sugars, pre-diabetes or diabetes starts happening and your cholesterol levels get elevated. All three of those things are fuel to the fire for developing coronary artery disease. Those are the blockages we're talking about. So you can't do anything about your genetics, but you can do a lot about your environment as far as diet and exercise go and do not smoke. This is another complex slide, but it's a very powerful slide. The only thing I want you guys to look at is the percent reductions in event rates in stroke, heart failure, and non-fatal myocardial infarction. MI is a heart attack, myocardial infarction. So if you just take a patient and decrease their blood pressure, from 160 to 150, you're gonna have a 19% decrease in stroke, a 12% decrease in heart failure, and a 12% decrease in heart attack, myocardial infarction. I always say this to my patients because they, they don't understand that listening and doing and living the right life really has huge impacts on major vascular events like strokes and heart attacks. Women's heart disease. I alluded to this earlier. There is, we have learned probably over the last 20 years that there is significant difference between gender and races with cardiovascular disease. And I love these slides because um, they came from my director of women's heart disease because they basically show you men and women do think differently. And if you look at that slide on the, the, the graphic on the bottom right, that is sociologically how women prioritize uh, their lives, themselves last, their husbands second to last, their pets, that's funny, the pet is more than the, the husband, home, work, parents, and then their children are always the most important. But that's important because women don't necessarily prioritize their health and themselves first. Why is that important? If you look before 2000, women were having heart disease as well. They were having strokes, they were having heart attacks but their event rates, their deaths were much higher than men. And that was primarily because we as cardiologists in most of our studies were on males, number one. Number two, women's symptoms present very differently than men. So what I learned in medical school in my textbook of somebody feeling like uh, uh, an elephant was stepping on their chest, pressure on their chest, they called chest pain. A lot of women don't present that. Sometimes women present with back pain or they present with fatigue when they're going up the flight of stairs or uh, jaw pain. Women present, their disease presents less what we call classically and classically is what we were taught uh, in our medical school textbooks. As we've recognized that and we've switched our focus of research to uh, understand that, 
women's mortality is about the same as men's. Ethnicity. I think in 20 years, you will see the same thing in that curve. Right now, uh, certain ethnic groups have a higher cardiovascular event than um, uh, uh, European Caucasian descendant people. And you will see that it's mostly uh, Hispa Latin American and uh, Latin and uh, African uh, American patients. Uh, they have a significantly higher uh, event rate. They also have a significantly lower awareness that they are at a higher uh, event rate. Let's get into what cardiology is. So we're talk we've talked about seeing patients and examining them, coming up with a diagnosis, and that's a lot of what a cardiologist does when they see them, a patient in the office. Most of the times, you're really trying to do preventive cardiology. You're trying to tell them, look, you aren't that sick right now, but you're on your path of getting sick. And so all the things we just talked about, lifestyle and the risk factors, you work with them to modify them. And then you use medications to help control some of those things, blood pressure, diabetes, uh, cholesterols. But once you've done that, you may want to see if there's more disease or I can see a patient and I think to myself after talking to them or examining them, you know, I'm not so sure that this patient has disease or doesn't have disease. And that's where testing comes into play. So this is very important what I'm about to say. Bayes' theorem is the basis of cardiology. Bayes' theorem is pre-test probability. It's not the test, it's what we think before we send a patient for a test. So there's low risk, medium risk, and high risk groups. So if I take a bunch of 16 year old high school students that are on the track team and look for cardiovascular disease, blockages, plaque, high blood pressure, I'm not gonna find it because that's a group that's very, very low risk. So I'm not gonna order a lot of testing there. If I have a patient in my critical care unit that is having a heart attack, they're having chest pain, they're really, really sick, I'm not ordering many tests because I already know what they have. They, I know the diagnosis, so the testing is not gonna help me. Where testing helps all of us is in the moderate probability group, where we do not know, <coughs> excuse me, we do not know if they have the disease or they don't have the disease, but we suspect it. So the most, common test for figuring out if you have coronary artery disease is a nuclear stress test. You've seen, I'm sure people have heard stress tests. Um, uh, uh, let me tell you what these things are. So what we do in a nuclear stress test is we put a patient on a treadmill and you can see that treadmill and see how that treadmill is on an incline. Every three minutes, it gets a little bit faster and a little bit higher. And the treadmill exercise capacity is so, so predictive of outcome with patients without anything else, without any EKG, without any images, just how long a patient can go on that treadmill. We can tell, are these patients at high risk for cardiovascular event or are they at low risk for cardiovascular event? But the stress test starts with that and then they go under this camera. And you can see where it says gamma camera there. Uh, it's just a camera that goes around them. And what we do is, in their veins, we put a, a tracer, a, a nuclear tracer. And on the right, that's the images. And so what you will see on the top versus the bottom is what the images look like during exercise and then at rest. And then we compare them. So if an area is missing, if one of these orange areas is missing with exercise, then we know that the the nuclear tracer we gave, which is attached, which attaches itself to the red blood cells, did not get to that area. So we infer that there must have been a blockage there. And this is the mainstay of diagnosing cardiovascular disease, specifically coronary artery disease. The second most common test that you're going to hear about in cardiology is an echocardiogram. And echocardiograms or on the left, you'll see what it is, right? It's just a probe which sends ultrasound waves to the body. And then those ultrasound waves come back to the same transducer that's in, this, uh, in the technician's hand that's on the patient's chest. And then the frequency of the waves, if something is hard, like you send out a sound wave, it hits something hard, it'll come back much faster versus something soft. And the 
computer algorithm can create based upon the frequency of which the sound waves are coming back an image. And that's what an echocardiogram looks like. So you see on the right hand side here, that is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber. Back down here at the bottom at around five o'clock um, is, uh, is the left atrium. And over here is the right side with the right, right atrium, right ventricle. And remember, this is the unoxygenated blood that's going to wind up going to the lungs. And then it comes back into the left atrium oxygenated. And then it goes into the main pumping chamber of your heart, which is the left ventricle. What we are seeing now in cardiology with technology is a revolution in how we can see things non-invasively. The next big thing that is happening right now is CAT scan angiograms. Let me go back. You can see with the CAT scan angiograms, we can see images like this just from a CAT scan. And what is a CAT scan? CAT scan is basically using radiation to give us better, more detailed images. So not only can we see the whole heart, but we can see the heart arteries and we can actually see if there are blockages in the heart arteries without doing anything invasive. <clears throat> Beyond that, we can use CAT scan angiograms to show you here on the right hand side, all of your vasculature going to your lungs. So let's say one of these areas of the lung had a blood clot in it. You would not see the blood flow going to here. This is an amazing technology and it's revolutionizing the way we uh, uh, diagnose patients. Beyond CT is cardiac MRI. And cardiac MRI is the most detailed imaging that you can have. And you will see on the right-hand side here, remember that image of the uh, uh, echo and how kind of it was a little blurry? Look at how detailed cardiac MRI is. You can see the left ventricle, you can see the right ventricle, you can see the atriums. And in this heart right here, if you can't see it, I, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but there's a hole between the two ventricles, which is this patient's problem. This is how detailed cardiac MRI is. Look at this patient who has mechanical valves in their heart, and I'll review what valves are. Look at the detail by which we can actually see the mechanical valve. This is all done non-invasively. MRI, how does MRI get images? It's a magnet. It's using magnetic frequencies to get the detail of these images. It's really, really amazing to see how far we've come with this. So look at the three technologies. And I put this slide up so you guys could see the progression, echo, CT, cardiac MRI. Look at how much more detailed cardiac MRI and CT are than echocardiography. Now echocardiography is easy to use. It's much more portable because CT scans and MRIs, you can see they have, the patient has to be wheeled somewhere. The echo can actually go to the patient. In fact, we are working on, and they are uh, commercially available now, echocardiograms that, um, that are attached to iPhones um, and they give great images. So you, wherever your iPhone is or your portable phone is, you can put a little probe on it and we can get an echo. We're using it in the emergency rooms. We're using them at the bedside. You cannot do that with cardiac CT and cardiac MRI, at least not yet. Amazing pictures. See that? That's the left ventricle, right ventricle. You see how detailed the pictures are of the heart muscle. And the white stuff is the contrast, which represents the blood, basically. So this is your muscle that's dark. The white areas are the, the contrast that we see, and that's basically blood. All right, electrophysiology. So remember I talked to you about uh, the heart having being an electrical chamber. For the heart to pump, it needs an electrical signal. And if you look down here where it says P wave and activation of the atria, we're all born with a native pacemaker in our heart that pacemaker is going to give a electrical impulse. That electrical impulse is going to go from the top of the heart through the atrium into the ventricles because we are born with these fibers that act for lack of a better term, like wires within your heart. 
and there's a conduction system. That's what we call it because it conducts electricity. And that electrical impulse will go all the way through the heart. When the muscles, cells, feel that electrical impulse, they squeeze. And if you get a lot of impulses, you squeeze really fast. When you start exercising and you're running, your heart needs to beat faster because your body needs more blood. That pacemaker is going to send faster and faster electrical signals. And the EKG, which is a common thing, is basically a picture of your heart's electrical impulses. It can tell us a lot about whether you're having a heart attack, but it can tell us even more about your heart's electrical impulses and if they're functioning normally or not normally. The most common procedure that you're gonna see the electrophysiologist do, and I call my electrophysiologist the electrician. I'm a, a plumber because I'm an interventional cardiologist. I clean out arteries. The electricians fix the electricity. So this is a pacemaker. So what you see here on the left-hand side where you see the EKG and the heart image, you will see that the electrical impulses here are stopping at the atrium level. So they're not able to go all the way down to the ventricle. So the ventricle, if it doesn't feel the electric, electrical impulse, it will not squeeze. And if it does not squeeze, well, that's a heart that's not pumping and that's not a good thing and that's not gonna be a good event. So what they do is they put this thing in the middle, that is a pacemaker. And that, the silver thing in the middle, create, sends out electricity. It sends out electricity into these wires that go into the heart muscle. And so the cartoon on the right shows you how the electricians do it. They put this pacemaker just under your skin, but then they put the wires into your veins that come all the way into the heart. And those wires then touch the heart muscle itself. So the electricity that's generated by the actual pacemaker, the thing that's in white in that cartoon, travels down those wires and hits the electrical um, cells and the muscles of the heart, and that causes them to squeeze. There, the heart muscle is just looking for electrical impulses. If it sees the electrical impulse, it will squeeze. So when a patient can't give it to themselves themselves, we give pacemakers. Cardiac intervention. So this is what I do, and you're gonna have a whole lecture on this, but I have to show you a little bit more because I'm a plumber. So cardiac intervention, we use it to treat blocked arteries. I showed you this before, right? This is an artery, it's getting blocked, it's got a lot of plaque in it, or there's a blood clot in it. The patient's having no flow to their heart muscle. So the first thing that we do in this room, you can see here on the left-hand side, that's the procedure room. And really what it is, is just a fancy x-ray. So I get to watch how the blood travels down the heart arteries, a fancy moving x-ray. And when I see a blockage, I take a hair thin wire, hair, hair thin, and it traverses. I take it down all the arteries. I figure out the pathway, get it safely to where I need it to go past the blockage. And then it becomes a train track. The wire is the track and everything I put on that train track, that, that wire is what I will need to get to the blockage. So I've gone through the blockage with laying my track, that's the wire. And then what I do is I take a balloon usually, and there are other things I can use like lasers and uh, all kinds of devices to suck out plaque, destroy plaque, vaporize plaque, uh, clot. I do that and then I place a stent. And you've heard that term your whole life. This is what a stent looks like. Look at, look at that on that finger. So stents are very, very thin and small metal tubes that initially are put on a, a balloon. So they're crimped down. And then if you look at that graphic, that cartoon on the right, if you look at number four, we inflate that balloon. Actually, look at number three. We inflate that balloon and that expands that metal tube to create a new lumen, which is you know, the pathway within the heart artery. So I've gotten rid of the plaque, I inflate the stent, the stent keeps the artery open, and that's what a stent looks like. So stents 
were revolutionary for the treatment of uh, coronary artery disease. They were revolutionary for uh, saving people's lives uh, when they were having heart attacks. In the era where we did not have stents, we had about 30 or 40 percent of our patients, this is 30, 40 years ago, uh, who when they went for a procedure for while they were having a heart attack and we just used a balloon, 30 to 40 percent of those patients would require emergency open heart surgery. Uh, and now, it's less than 0.1%. So stents are very revolutionary uh, devices. I'm gonna show you a case. This is a real case. This is how we do, this is why being a cardiologist is so wonderful. I had a 42 year old male. He was a cab driver. He uh, started having chest pain. He turned himself around and drove to our emergency room. Before he got to the emergency room, he just pulled out his cab and in the sidewalk in front of the emergency room, he collapsed and he had what we call sudden cardiac death. And if you look at this EKG, this is an EKG of somebody who is having a massive, massive heart attack. If you look at where it says V4, V5, V6 at the end, go from V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Hopefully you can see that. What we call those in cardiology when we see those on an EKG is tombstones. Why? Because they look like tombstones and people that have those often wind up passing away. So when we saw this EKG, we didn't need to do any other testing. We knew exactly what was happening with this guy and we took him directly for our procedure. So let's see if this plays for you. So I can show this to you. So what you're going to see here, if you can't see my arrow, it's going to be hard for you to, to make this out. But the heart arteries are those black things that look like spiders, okay? And there's a main artery that all the other arteries come off of on the left side. That's called the left main. And then remember I told you about that artery that goes to the front of the heart, the LAD? If you look, there's a stump right about 12 o'clock. Look right under the L of my LAD and you'll see that there's a stump there. See how the die kind of stops? That is a 100% blockage. And if you look on the image that's playing on the right, it's the same thing, right? If you look under the D and come straight down, there's a little nipple here and that should have blood flow all the way through but there is no blood flow because there's 100% blockage. And that's what that EKG was showing us. And patients that have that particular blockage that I'm showing you, that is known as the widow maker because that blockage will kill you within two minutes. So this patient came to us and the first thing we did, you see that rate, rate, hair thin wire that we've put down? And I wish you could see my. Uh, 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 you can see your arrow. Your you can arrow. see it. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So you'll see it. This is my catheter, the tube that I'm engaging the heart arteries with. And then what I've done is I've wired with that razor, the hair thin wire, all the way down. And then this little dot here, watch it, is a device where I'm going in and sucking out the blood clot and the plaque. And if you look on the right here, remember there was a stump here, right? Under the end, there was a stump. There was no blood flow. Now look, there's a whole big artery. And that artery, why it's so important is because it's two thirds of the blood flow to the heart. So we open the artery and you can see here on the left, we put in a stent. Remember there was a stump here where my arrow is. Now there's good blood flow all the way down and you can see in different views, there's really, really good blood flow. So this person actually did great. This is his heart muscle function, which is very important. So if you look, this is a catheter. That catheter is called a pigtail catheter, right? You can kind of figure out why it looks like a pig's tail. That's what we actually, that's the actual technical term for it is the pigtail catheter. And so we put that into the heart muscle and we inject dye and we see how much of that dye actually can uh, come out of the heart. And you can see in this patient, very, very lucky guy. We inject the dye and all of the dye actually leaves and comes out of the heart muscle. So he had uh, sudden death. He had a heart attack. He had sudden death. He happened to have it 
in on the sidewalk outside of the emergency room. We were able to defibrillate him. We were able to get an EKG. We saw that EKG with those tombstones and he came directly up to me. And we were able to, in 38 minutes, 38 minutes total from when he collapsed to when he went to the CCU, our critical care unit, fix everything and he was fine. He was discharged two days later. I still see him uh, as a patient. And I always tell him, as I tell all of my heart patients that have had this happen, you hit the lottery. You didn't hit the lottery with money, but you hit the life lottery because you should have been dead at 42 years old. You're gonna to live to 102 years old. And that's the beauty of being a cardiologist. Structural heart disease. You're gonna get an in-depth lecture on structural heart disease. This is a new field within cardiology. Um, I call it science fiction, right? It is, to this day, when I see the things that my structural interventionalists are able to do, I am blown away by it. It really is focused on the valves. And I haven't talked to you about the valves. I talked to you about chambers. There's the right atrium, right? Blue blood unoxygenated coming here, going into the right ventricle, going into the lungs. Then it comes back into the left atrium and it goes through a valve called the mitral valve. This valve on the right side from the right atrium to the right ventricle is called the tricuspid valve. And then when it goes to the lungs, it's called the pulmonic valve but the two most important valves are on the left side. Makes sense, right? Like that's the heart is pumping, it's receiving oxygenated blood. Oxygenated blood is what keeps us alive. So those are the valves that we need to really function. And those unfortunately are the valves that get maybe overworked um, and have the most disease. So the mitral valve is the valve that separates between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And then the aortic valve is the main valve. When the heart muscle squeezes, when that left ventricle squeezes, the <clears throat> aortic valve is the main door that opens up and allows the blood to get into the aorta. So the most common problem with the aortic valve is that it gets calcified or it gets stuck and it cannot open. So now you have a heart muscle that's trying very, very hard to squeeze oxygenated blood out, but the door is stuck. It's not opening. So a lot of the blood can't get out and the heart muscle will begin to fail because it's trying so hard on every single beat to try and get past this stuck valve. That disease is known as aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, 10 years ago, it's a disease of aging. So as we all age, some of us will get aortic stenosis. As we're all living longer, we're seeing more and more patients get aortic stenosis in their 70s, in their 80s, in their 90s. Even my 100 plus year olds have this. <clears throat> As patients got older, the old treatment for this was open heart surgery. An open heart surgery is a wonderful, wonderful treatment option, but as you get older, many of the patients can't tolerate the surgery itself. They're too frail, they're too sick, their lungs are not good, their kidneys are not good. So just trying to do the surgery to fix the aortic valve, they would have died going into the surgery. So we developed something called a TAVR, which has been revolutionary. In the trial that was done, it showed a 40% improvement in death rates for patients that were elderly and had aortic stenosis. 10 years ago, we would look at our elderly patients that had this, that were not good candidates for open heart surgery. And we would basically say, you have whatever days you have left, try and enjoy them. Um, you're gonna have episodes where you're having chest pain, where you're uh, passing out, where you're developing fluid on your lungs. Um, and it was a sad conversation because their brains were fine. They still wanted to live great lives. They wanted to hang out with their grandchildren. They wanted to go play golf or tennis or swim, but their bodies wouldn't let them. Now with TAVR, what we do, remember how I told you we had a balloon with a stent on it? We just have a new valve on the balloon. And so we take cross over the aortic valve and we inflate a balloon that has a new valve crimped onto the, uh, onto the balloon. So once we inflate it, we pin up your old God-given disease valve. And once we pull the balloon down, a new valve pops up 
and starts functioning. It has been a revolutionary treatment for cardiology, and it's been a godsend for many of our elderly patients who had aortic stenosis. They go back and they start, you know, living completely normal and healthy lives. Um, the next big valve that we're working on is the mitral valve. So the mitral valve is um, a more difficult valve to treat than the aortic valve. Luckily, it doesn't have as much disease as the aortic valve, but the same scenario would happen with the mitral valve. We would have valves that either blocked up or more likely with the mitral valve, they would start to um, uh, leak. And once they leak, when the left ventricle would pump new blood, that blood that it received from the left atrium, not only would that blood go out into the aorta where it was supposed to go through the aortic valve, because the mitral valve was leaking, the blood would leak back into the left atrium. Now the left atrium is getting blood from the heart, from, from the lungs, oxygenated blood, and it's getting blood back from the left ventricle. The left atrium would get very large and then the left ventricle would get large. It was doing double the work and the heart muscle is just a motor. It can get overworked and overburdened and it will fail. So what we've been able to do now is without doing open heart surgery, with a procedure, put a catheter through the catheter, fix this valve by putting clips so it doesn't leak. And we just started this here at Lenox Hill. We're actually doing trans, um, trans catheter replacement, just like we did with the TAVR, where we inflate the balloon and a new valve shows up. We're doing that in the uh, uh, mitral position. In 10 years, this, all of this is going to be the mainstay of therapy for valvular disease. And again, it is a godsend for our elderly patients uh, for both length of life, but most importantly, quality of life. Heart failure. You've heard me say that multiple, multiple times. I'm sure many of you have heard the term heart failure. Heart failure is the most common diagnosis in the United States of America. The reason so what is heart failure? Heart failure is what this slide is showing you on the left. This is a normal heart muscle in size. Once a heart muscle gets damaged, most likely from a blockage that didn't let blood flow go there, or it could be from valvular disease, or it could be from the electrical system going haywire. There are lots of ways a heart muscle can get abnormal, but what it means is it's gotten large. Right? You can see that the dotted outline, that's what a normal heart diameter or dimension should be. And you can see what this actually looks like. It's much bigger. And once a heart gets big and swollen, it can't not pump effectively. When a heart doesn't pump effectively, what happens in the body is that you'll see in this cartoon, the patient's legs start to swell. So one of the first signs that we see of heart failure is swelling of the ankles and the legs because the blood is pooling because of gravity to the lowest point. And as that blood and that fluid continues to creep up the body from the legs up into the belly, eventually it will get into the lungs. And so now you've got a lot of fluid inside the lung tissue. And once you have fluid in the lung tissue, the lungs can no longer effectively give oxygen to the unoxygenated blood, and that is heart failure. So patients feel very, very short of breath. There are many, many things we've done in heart failure to really revolutionize it. Uh, uh, medications are amazing. Um, they oftentimes can show heart muscle function improvement. It makes people feel better. But some people, even with medications, progress. And what we're starting to do now, obviously, the the ultimate treatment is heart transplantation. Uh, heart transplantation has a lot of issues. The biggest issue with heart transplantation is the availability of a heart. Uh, there are a lot of people with heart failure that need hearts and there are not that many hearts that become available. So we are starting to develop and use these things called LVADs. They're not a fully artificial heart, but if you can see this, what we do is we implant a motor right in the middle there, okay? so. A weakened heart muscle can't pump. So we just collect the blood from the left ventricle, we put it into the motor, and that goes right out into the aorta. So the motor actually functions 
as the pump to getting oxygenated blood uh, out to the body. We're using these, we used to use these as bridges, meaning we keep you alive with this for as long as we can until a heart becomes available. But the technology is getting to the point where we call this a destination technology, where we may not even need a heart. Maybe we just keep this going and it functions for you by letting the oxygenated blood get to your body. So the big thing in heart failure is going to be destination mechanical support, which is kind of a simple way of thinking about it is an artificial heart, but not a fully artificial heart, a device that helps your heart beat and you live a normal life. Cardiac surgery. This will be my last slide and I'll leave a uh, time open for questions. Cardiac surgery, and you're gonna get a really, really uh, a detailed uh, uh, lecture on this. This is basically open heart surgery. So what do we do in open heart surgery? We take the sternum, your chest bone, it gets cut, we expose it, and we see the heart, okay? And we can either fix the valves by replacing a valve, repairing a valve. Most commonly, what we do is take bypasses. And you guys have heard of this, right? Single bypass, double bypass, triple bypass, quadruple bypass. Remember those arteries I showed you? The artery to the front, the LAD, the artery to the left side of the heart, the circumflex and the uh, artery to the right side of the heart, right coronary artery. They can get blockages. Sometimes those blockages are so advanced, so severe that I can't get through them. I cannot put my wire through them. I cannot put my stent through them or it's just not safe. Or we've learned that doing lots of stents in some patients is not as good as doing open heart surgery long-term. So there are many different criteria that come into whether we do a stent or we do open heart surgery. But when we do do open heart surgery for those blockages, all we're doing, this is why they call it a bypass. Imagine that the blockage is at the front part of the artery on the front of the heart, the LAD. You take one of your other arteries, the lima, or you take a vein and you connect it to the aorta and you bypass that proximal LED blockage with this tube that goes past it. So now it's like a, a, a road. There's a blockage in the road. They create a detour around it. That detour is the bypass. And how many you do is whether you do a single, double, triple, or quadruple. Cardiac surgery is evolving. Um, this, uh, you can imagine if you cut your chest bone and you have your ribs kind of sp spread apart, is very traumatic to the patient. The recovery, the pain, what we call the morbidity, can be a solid four to eight weeks for recovery. Cardiac surgery now is starting to do minimally invasive surgeries, and you can see that in the cartoon for the minimally invasive. Uh, <clears throat> we do, are able to now cut no bones. There will be no bones that are cut, we can go in between the ribs, use the robot, go in and do our bypasses with the robot. The recovery on this, I've had amazing recoveries from patients on this, three to five days, two weeks at the maximum, and they do great. So even cardiac surgery uh, uh, is evolving significantly. So I went through a lot of stuff with you guys. I've left about 10 minutes um, for you to uh, ask me questions. Uh, thank you very much. And let's have questions. Can you um, see the chat function on Zoom right now? Let me see. Should I end the show? Yeah, end, end screen sharing. Okay, I see the chat function. All right, I'm going to open it up now and you can just take questions as they come. All right, hold on, let me, they're, they're, they're flying fast here. Yeah, I mean, so let, let, let's just start at the top. And that's the best bet, I think, yeah. Is there a way to get to the top? Let's see. Okay. With regards to modifiable risk factors for heart disease, the abnormal cholesterol levels refer to high or low levels of LDL or HDL. Very good question. So uh, there are two, there's total cholesterol. Total cholesterol is broken up into three, thing, three, three different things. Triglycerides, which are just your fat levels. Triglycerides 
are directly related to what you eat. If you go and have a high fat meal, go to McDonald's and have a, a McDonald's super size, whatever, and let me draw your bloods an hour later, your triglycerides will be over 1500. Directly related to what you eat and how much alcohol you drink there, right? The second two particles are LDL and HDL. So this is how you have to think about cholesterol. HDL is actually good cholesterol. It's the cholesterol that goes out to the arteries and kind of removes cholesterol and plaque and can regress it. So you, you want a lot of HDL. How do we get a lot of HDL? Number one, some people are just genetically lucky that their livers produce a lot of HDL. Most of us, the best way to get a lot of HDL is through regular aerobic exercise. Regular aerobic exercise, you can increase your HDLs by 10 to 20%, which is incredibly powerful. LDL is the bad cholesterol. So LDL is the cholesterol that goes out and drops the cholesterol into the artery walls and has plaque, right? That's how plaque accumulates. And so how you treat LDL, same thing, diet, exercise, and these medications called statins. Statins change the way your liver metabolizes cholesterol to decrease how much LDL you have. They are revolutionary. Since the advent of statins, cholesterol modifying medications, reducing the LDL, we've had a 25% decrease in heart attacks in the United States. During that same period of time, the US Public Health Service has decreased smoking significantly in the United States. Those two together have dropped heart attacks, acute heart attacks in the United States by 50% over the last 20 years. So lifestyle, education, it actually works. All right, let's find uh, another question. All right, here's another one that goes, uh, goes along with what, what, what we were just talking about. To what extent would a vegan plant-based diet help prevent heart disease? Vegan plant-based diets, uh, no question, are one of the big things that you can do for your lifestyle. Um, you know, we always tell our patients that the, the only studies, the multiple studies that have shown that the true Mediterranean diet, the true Mediterranean diet, which means one serving of red meat in 30 days, lots of fishes, a little bit of chicken, lots of vegetables. In every diet study that's ever been done, the true Mediterranean diet has actually improved life expectancy. So we know that the true Mediterranean diet works. There's a lot of data that plant and vegan uh, uh, diets do the same thing. Some studies show that you may actually be even be able to regress your plaque from that. All right, let's keep going. All right, here's a question about cardiac surgery. Is robotic techni technique used a lot nowadays? What are the biggest advantages of using robotic technique? So the robotic technique is used whenever we can use it. Some patients, because of their body size or where their blockages are, we cannot use the robot. We cannot get there. Uh, you often see this in very obese patients. Sometimes people have really, really bad lungs and that prevents us from being able to use the robot. So we want to try and use the robot as much as we can. And the advantage is because it is less traumatic and the morbidity is significantly less. So patients recover much faster. All right, let's see what else we have here. How often might artificial valves and bypasses require maintenance? Another very good question. So <clears throat> coronary artery disease, anything that we do, we are stamping out a fire, but the entire forest is on fire. The patient with medication and lifestyle has to learn to put out the forest fire. So when we put out stamping out the fire, sometimes it does come back. Bypass surgeries can last seven to 10 years. I've had some bypass surgeries last 50 years. Um, again, it's very individual. Valvular disease, usually when we put in an aortic valve, that thing is good for 20 years. When we repair a mitral valve, that's good for the rest of your life. Um, so each 
surgery we do, each person, it can be individual, but all cardiovascular disease is a chronic disease, right? You, the, that forest fire is continuing to go on and the patient has to put out the forest fire. When there are fires that rage, you come to the cardiologist, the cardiac surgeons, we stamp those out, but the entire forest fire is raging. Okay, let's find another one. How often do you work with LVADs? Do you work alongside clinical engineers? So that's that left ventricular assist device we talked about with patients that have heart failure, the destination, sometimes we use it as a bridge. Uh, LVADs are, um, they're revolutionary and we're uh, using them all the time in our transplant centers. Um, the partnership between physicians and clinical engineers and scientists all three of us are equally important. We cannot do one without the other. The final product requires all three of us. So we do work very closely with the engineers. We work very closely um, with, uh, 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 with, uh, with the scientists that uh, design these things. Maybe I'll do one or two more. Josh, you think that's okay? Yep, that would work. You got like three more minutes left. Okay. What symptoms are usually present, uh, uh, present in identifying heart disease? Excellent question, very practical question. So most of the times, heart disease presents based upon where the, what the disease is. Let's say it's high blood pressure. A lot of times patients who have high blood pressure come in with headaches or dizziness. Let's say it's an arrhythmia, an electrical system problem. Most of the time they come in with racing heartbeats or they have passed out. And you can imagine why they passed out, right? Their electrical system didn't get the electricity down to the left ventricle, it didn't pump. If the ventricle doesn't pump, no blood goes out and the brain doesn't get blood, you pass out, right? Patients who have coronary artery disease, they often present with chest pain. And that chest pain can be pressure in the chest, it can be shortness of breath. I had a patient yesterday who said to me, I'm just suddenly getting short of breath when I'm just sitting here. Or when I walk to the bathroom and come back, I'm getting short of breath. No chest pain. If you asked him, are you having chest pain? He would say, absolutely not. He'd say, I'm just getting short of breath. Even when I'm just sitting here, it comes, then it goes. He had a 95% blockage of the artery to the front of his heart. As I was fixing it and I ballooned, the blockage. I'm going to stop some flow from going into the artery. He looked at me and he said, I'm having that shortness of breath now. And so symptoms of coronary artery disease are variable. The most common are chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue with exertion. Patients will often say, you know, I used to be able to walk down to my neighborhood, whatever, and I was fine. But over the last six weeks, I, I walk and I'm getting very, very tired. I'm not short of breath. I'm not chest. I'm not having chest pain, but I'm just really, really tired. So the symptoms are very uh, unique and varied be between patients. All right, I'll do one more. When there is a total blockage and you cannot use a stent, what do you do in those cases? So that does happen. Sometimes people come to us and their blockages have been ignored for so long that they've become so hard and so complicated that no matter what I do to try and chisel through, and I have lots of devices that help me chisel through, little jackhammers, lasers, and there are probably, you know, 1% of my cases that we try everything and that there, nothing that we try actually works to get through. That's when we stop and we see if the patient is a good candidate for bypass surgery. But sometimes those patients aren't even good candidates for bypass surgery. And then we continue their treatment with uh, medications. All right, I'll stop with that at 12 noon. Um, thank hey, you guys Arun. very much and I hope you enjoyed it. Verinder, thanks so much, Dr. Singh. That was fantastic. Hey everyone. Anyone still around? Um, we're going to go back in and just check in on Dr. Bookfar. We're actually done. The, the whole tumor's out. We're going to start closing, but I figured I would show you guys for a minute. 
what was going on. I'm just waiting for the, they're cleaning it up in there. Um, I do have a reminder today at 4 p.m. We're doing tumor talk. This is a webinar that I do with Dr. Bookvar, um, and it's kind of a collaborative effort between the Journal of Neuro-Oncology uh, and Lenning Cell Neurosurgery. And we discuss recent publications in the field of brain and spinal cord tumors. So if you're around at 4 p.m., sign in. These are not you know, mandatory in any way whatsoever. Today, we're going to be discussing an innovative technique uh, that's very much in the preliminary research phases for treating glioblastoma. And so it should be an interesting uh, conversation. The access for Tumor Talk is actually in my Instagram. Um, I posted it today. And then Josh, maybe you can post an actual link. All right, all right, we're going back in here now. I linked the uh, Lennox Hill Neurosurgery Instagram page on Facebook. It does, all right. So I'm gonna go to the video screen here. We're back in the OR. So like I said, we're, we're pretty much complete here. We've kind of come circumferentially around the tumor you guys can see on the screen. That's Dr. Bookfar operating right there. Uh, he's holding a bipolar cautery in one hand and a suction in the other hand. And they're just cleaning up some, um, some of the blood supply along the, the side of it where it was attached to the dura. So I'm trying to hold this steady in here. There we go. All right, and so totally freed up. That's the final, final portion of it there. So there's the meningioma. And that's it, it's out. So that's the entirety of the lesion, all right? That, everything's out. Uh, we'll get some final hemostasis now. And um, you know, we'll end up putting, we'll put a covering over the dura there, put the bone flap back on and uh, sew up the skin. It's going to look like we were never there. So thanks so much for watching everyone. Hopefully I'll see some of you at 4 p.m. today. All right. Uh, have a great afternoon and we'll see you tomorrow morning also for the rest of you. Take care.